So I will introduce uh, our first speaker, uh, Sven Olof Wallenstein. He's an associate professor of philosophy and aesthetics at Södertörn University. And Sven Olof has published widely on both philosophy, aesthetics and architecture. Among the uh, books that maybe uh, could be of uh, large interest for you are The Silences of Mies, that came out, was published 2008, Biopolitics and the Emergence of Modern Architecture, 2009. And then, in fact, uh, me and Sven Olav, we are editors for a book which is called Swedish Modernism, Architecture, Consumption, and the Welfare State. Uh, and this will be released, in fact, here at the museum, uh, Architekturmuseet, the 2nd of October. And it will be a small symposium in relation to this release also. So welcome, Sven Olof. Thank you. Uh, Okay, can you hear me? So, for the next hour, I, I will attempt to survey a theoretical development in, 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 in recent years, which has come to connect architecture to new kind of philosophy of life. Uh, f sorry, I should mention that there is no title to my talk. <laughs> uh, you didn't say that, but approximately you could say something like new politics, life, and architecture. And I'll come back to this idea of new politics, which is spelled with a double O, new politics. New politics. So, connecting architecture to a new philosophy of life. And this new line of research draws on earlier philosophies based in even older traditions of kind of vitalist thinking from the turn of the former century. For instance, in Henri Bergson and Gabriel Tal. But it also rethinks these themes in the context of contemporary global capitalism, which is increasingly geared towards the dimension of affectivity and corporality, and attempts to penetrate into the sphere which underlies our conscious mental operations and, and extends all the way down to a biological existence. So this idea of biopolitics and no-politics has to do with the way in which architecture and the arts in general intervene into our, somehow the very substructure of our biological existence. A starting point for this development could be located in the research of Michel Foucault. As I mentioned, the, the term biopolitics or biopower, that is those mechanisms and forms of power that invest the human body as, as a a kind of locus of productivity and action. Uh, uh, and, and in this sense, also situate the subject in a certain way. The subject as at once disciplined and free, or at least endowed with a certain agency. And these theories were developed by Foucault in, in the latter half of the 1970s, um, I mean, mostly on the basis of, of, of the reading of the transformation of political theory in the, in the 18th century, but they have been picked up and developed in different ways by thinkers like Gilles Deleuze and his writings on the information structure of society, uh, and, and, and also by the it Italian philosopher and sociologist Maurizio Lazzarato in his books where he develops this idea of a new politics, to which, I will, to which I will come back here. So, and within architecture theory, similar ideas have been developed, although here often with a kind of inverse intent of, of dismantling or even rejecting the kind of critical perspective that underlies the theoretical work of, Mother, of Lazarato and Foucault. And ideas of the post-critical or a projective architecture, which we probably uh, talked about yesterday, have been formulated to underscore the kind of necessity to move beyond inherited models of resistance, negativity, and rupture, sometimes even as a kind of rejection of theory as such. There's been talk of a kind of effective turn which then points to this way in which architecture intervenes into the biological structure of our life. So I think uh, a more precise investigation of how our contemporary sensorial and, and kind of noetic environment impacts on our existence sometimes is argued to render impossible the categories on which critical theory has been based for at least 100 years. So my contribution consists then of a critical survey of these new developments, but I will also, and more importantly, attempt to locate them as part of the discussion of the possibility of developing a critical theory in general. And I would argue that these ideas of the noetic and the effective and the biopolitical, or the biopolitical by no means render critical theory unnecessary or useless, but in fact demand of us that we somehow invent a new form of critical theory. So this will be my argument, a survey of this development, a way of countering the idea that they somehow render a critical theory useless and, and a kind of proposal for what critical theory could be. <clears throat> 
Okay, starting with Foucault, the first part here, which is, deals with Foucault, Deleuze, and the power of life. Foucault develops these concepts of biopower and biopolitics, which I take here to be roughly synonymous, which is not necessarily true. He develops these themes at a critical juncture in his work, where he begins to doubt the explicative force of the disciplinary model, which he had developed in the very famous book called Discipline and Punish from 1975. I'm sure you all heard about this book, Discipline and Punish. And, and the first mentioning of this idea of biopolitics, of biopower, we found in, 19, in 1976, in the first volume of the history of sexuality, where it seems to be like, almost like an extension of the idea of discipline from the earlier book. I mean, discipline and punish had already pursued this theme in terms of the inscription of the body into an institutional field with, with institutions like the army, the school, hospital, prison, etc. And here you find certain hints of what you could call a kind of proto-architectural analysis in Foucault, where he, I mean, most famously, of course, in his discussion of Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon prison. And, 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 uh, and Foucault argues that the, the, the transformation of discipline from naked violence to visible punishment to more subtle and, and, and diffuse correctional techniques have been increasingly assembled around the body and they have generated a kind of political technology that produces the soul as a new object of knowledge. The soul which then in a certain sense can be called the prison of the body as, as Foucault famously says. So discipline Foucault argues is not primarily about prohibiting I mean, just as power in his analysis is not necessarily about blocking, arresting, or, or breaking something up. But discipline is about, is about creating a positive organizational space and time, a kind of partition and creation of segmented unities and a breaking down of movements and bodies into the most minute details. For instance, as a military exercise, for instance, or the, the various postures you find of the body in school, in school, for instance. So space, time, and bodies, they are parceled up and then reassembled so as to become parts of larger and more efficient unities. And of course, the Panopticon prison is the most famous case of this. So military camps, prisons, hospitals, schools, factories, each in their respective ways, become places for the creation of docile bodies, as Foucault says. And in conjunction with this, there is a development of corresponding discourses on military regulations, criminal law, pedagogy, political economy, and a whole plethora of discourses that, as it were, are connected to this disciplining of the body. So discipline encounters new types of discourse, and together they form what Foucault calls a power and knowledge complex that increasingly comes to focus on precisely that which escapes it. I mean, the emphasis on norms instead of emphasis on law produces correspondingly an in infinite possibility of deviations which do not pre-exist the norm, but they emerge in kind of infinitesimal fluctuations around the norm. Mm -hmm. And the object of the legal as well as the sexual apparatus, of course, says, can be understood as the production of various forms of deviation, criminality, perversion, which is then may integrate into this larger disciplinary whole. So this is the basic model outlined in, in, in Discipline and Punish, and I'm sure you know it all. Mm -hmm. And, and the question then often posed to Foucault is where he might possibly locate the idea of resistance. I mean, if power and knowledge, I mean, although without being reducible to each other, if they form this kind of interlocking totality, where would you find an outside that would be provide thinking and acting with a point of leverage? How can you resist this infinitely minute and, and, and miniaturized structure of power and knowledge? And I think the theoretical model for such a resistance can be found in Nietzsche, which is, of course, the, the, the major source of inspiration for Foucault's analysis. I mean, in Nietzsche's reflections on what Nietzsche called the prehistorical work, for instance, in the book Genealogy of Morals, the prehistorical work that is required for the formation of any kind of responsible agent. And, and, and this outside world of forces is, as it were, a kind of milieu into which, in which something like the creation of docile bodies becomes, becomes possible. But then again, this milieu will always subsist under any such body as a kind of virtual double, a kind of non-bounded multiplicity into which all forces will tap. And I think Foucault, in drawing on Nietzsche, he's particularly influenced by Deleuze's book, Nietzsche and Philosophy from 1962, where Deleuze, in fact, was one of the first to suggest in the early 60s that Nietzsche's genealogy should be understood as a critical analysis of power relations that takes the body as a focal point of analysis. Not then the body in the sense of phenomenology as a kind of ground of sense, you know, the live, the living bodies, as opposed to the körper, as opposed to the mecha. Somehow, somehow mechanized body, but a body that is being constantly done and undone and reconstructed and constructed as a kind of assemblage of, of 
affects and responses. And, and taking the body as a guide to philosophy is also the proposal that would later open Deleuze's second book on Spinoza, Spinoza Practical Philosophy, which, where he develops this idea of the soul as a kind of um, only partial interpretation of what a body might, might be capable of. There is a very famous quote from Spinoza's Ethics, which Deleuze uses over and over again. He says, this is a quote from Spinoza Ethics, Book 3, Theorem 2, Remark. Uh, in fact, no one has been able to determine what a body is capable of. That is, experience has not yet enlightened us as to what the body, to the extent that it is not determined by the soul, can or cannot do according to the laws of nature, if the latter is considered solely as corporeal. That is, we do not yet know what a body is capable to the extent that we think the body as part of nature and not just as the opposite of the soul. I think this is a very profound source of inspiration for Foucault's idea that there is this kind of virtual corporeal dimension that underlies all formed disciplined bodies. Uh, uh, and this domain that in Deleuze's meta metaphysics underlies the formed body, he has provided many versions of this. I mean, he draws on Nietzsche, on Bergson, but also on writers and painters like Artaud and Bacon. It is also what Deleuze in his reading of Foucault sees as this underlying somehow microphysical dimension. It is because of this instability, this instability of this underlying dimension that there is a becoming of the body. There is a kind of, there's a distant roar of a battle, as Foucault says at the end of Discipline and Punish. It can always be heard, be heard somehow behind the official eloquence of, of form discourses. And this does, for core, not mean that there is some true truth to this. There's a kind of a true or authentic body that underlies the discursive order, a true body that would be somehow just deformed by external forces, only that it remains a source of resistance. And it indicates why, as Foucault often says, resistance comes first. So in this sense, this idea of an unbounded multiplicity of the body is the source from which resistance always draws, which also means that for core, resistance is somehow ethically neutral. Resistance is neither good nor bad. Resistance is what happens because there is a multiplicity underlying the body. So there is an always a necessity of resistance to power. Okay, uh, for core then, I mean, as we noted first, the, the, the kind of first presentation of, of the theme of biopolitics, which we'll talk about a bit more here, in the final section of the first volume of the history of sexuality, still largely remains within this disciplinary model. And the biopolitical power, as Foucault explains it in, the, in, this, in this first instance, works on three ways, on three levels. On, on the micro level, it works by individualization, or more precisely by producing individuality. That is producing sex, sexualized, desiring subjects that are endowed with a certain depth that, 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 that we can, uh, let's say, decipher is in the case of Freudian psychoanalysis on the micro level. On the macro level, we see the emergence of the concept of population. Population, which is a kind of statistical phenomenon. It is individuals as they appear in terms of collective or collective health, collective birth, mortality rates, natality rate, etc. Between them, we find the intermediary link, the family, the family, which is this kind of site of exchange between individuals and collectives. The family being the relay through which all individuals have to pass in order to become members of the reproductive body politic. So, on all these three levels, I mean, population, family, and individual, life becomes the object of regulation and discipline. But at the same moment, there emerges a kind of power inside life that resists. That is the possibility of philosophical vitalism. And Foucault briefly alludes to Nietzsche as a typical case of such a philosophical vitalism. So in this sense, the power exerted over life, Foucault suggests, is also the emancipation of a resistance force inside life. I mean, just as the disciplinary diagrams could not be, de could not be deployed without creating or reproducing this kind of plethora of unbounded multiplicities. And, 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 and I think Foucault's early work on architecture from the 70s on the hospitals, for instance, which I have developed analysis of in, in the book that, that Helena mentioned, can be seen precisely in this sense, how, how, how the kind of control over life also re somehow constitutes a kind of adversary life to the first life. So this is the first model that Foucault provides of biopolitics. But then there is a very important shift, and I think this is not at all been noticed, in, in, in I'm really not aware of this in my book either. I mean, I think it's just beginning to be noticed here, that, that there's a very important shift in Foucault's work in the mid, after this, in around 76, 77. Then you, fi and you find this shift in, in his two lecture series, Security, Territory, Population of 77, 78, and, and the birth of biopolitics from 78 to 79. 
And, and in these lectures, in addition to this idea of population, Foucault points to the emergence of the concept of security. Security becomes essential since now threats emanate from within the state, from within the space of the state, from within the population itself and its inherent tendency to create imbalances, deviations, unpredictable crises, whereas the old model of sovereignty, which aimed to seize and preserve control over a territory, predominantly understood dangers as coming from without. So in, in these later lectures, Foucault comes to connect biopolitics to security, and it is now explicitly dissociated from discipline. So biopolitics is not about discipline. This is very important. And Foucault says, I said this um, in my earlier work, and he's, he's implicitly referring to discipline and punish, but it was wrong. <laughs> One of those moments where Foucault explicitly corrects himself. So we should not connect biopower to discipline, but to the emergence of security. And as we will see, security also connects to a certain idea of freedom. And this is why a biopolitics for Foucault will be connected to liberalism and the emergence of a political theory of freedom. Foucault begins by, by uh, citing the example of theft. You can say that, you can say there are three ways in which you can somehow counter the problem of theft in a society. Uh, uh, I mean, first you can understand theft as a kind of infraction that must be punished according to a predetermined or preset scale of punishment. That is, as a juridical or legal problem with a basis in law. That's the first idea. Law and sovereignty in a kind of dual division. Either you are a thief or you're not. Secondly, you can treat it as a form of deviant behavior that must be corrected through, corrected through various techniques. For instance, as a disciplinary problem, you have a deviant behavior and individuals need to be brought back to the norm. That is, they should not, they should not commit theft. Third and finally, and this is a new invention here, uh, it can be theorized as a statistical phenomenon. That is, situation where you must balance the, ga the gains and losses of disciplinary measures. And you must perhaps even allow for a certain latitude of crime. I mean, crime is not essentially a negative thing. There is a certain positive dimension of crime. That is. You formulate the problem in terms of security. How, what is the optimum amount of crime that you must allow for in certain society? You cannot eradicate crime, as in the legal model, and neither can you discipline criminals, as in the disciplinary models, but you have to allow for a kind of uh, uh, optimal amount of crime in a certain society. That, that is, you balance gains and losses, and you think of crime in terms of security. So if sovereignty, for course, says, you know, is exerted over a territory, a multiplicity of political subjects. And discipline is, is applied to singular bodies, to their affects and passions. Security can be said to work with a set of fluid conditions. It, 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 it applies to fluctuating quantities and future prob prob probabilities. I mean, posing the problem in terms of security means to invent a kind of multifunctional order and to calculate the negative and positive outcome of any given measure. It does not apply to a fixed state, but to a series of future events. So you can say if, if, if sovereignty monopolizes a territory and locates the central command, discipline structures a space and sets up a hierarchy, security attempts to plan an environment or a milieu, as Foucault says, in relation to a set of possible events. And I'm not going to go into it here, but he, he also chooses architectural models for this in the city of Nantes in, in France is the case of this. The word milieu, he says, doesn't really emerge into urban, urbanist discourse until the beginning of the 19th century, but it's there as a technical scheme, he says, in, this, in the 18th century. You think of the milieu as, 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 as an environment for, for somehow future events. And the city, the problem of the city becomes essential here. Biopolitics is a thought of the city, a thinking of the city, for course. Uh, uh, and, and discipline strives towards the regulation of details, whereas security allows things to run their course at a certain level. It lets things be. And this is, of course, the origin of the famous French phrase, you know, laissez-faire, the laissez-faire liberalist theory, said, of course, this emerges out of this problem of security, which is why biopolitics will be connected to liberalism for him. Uh, and I mean, discipline, of course, has divides things into licit and illicit. And to this extent, it is still based on, on a law which is supposed to exist and then to be increasingly specified. Uh, whereas, uh, 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 security works with this kind of fluid future conditions, and, and, and the division between licit and illicit is not really is not really somehow relevant to the problem problems of, of security. So, in this sense, you can see that Foucault, when he invents, where he develops this idea of, of biopolitics more explicitly in the late 70s, he begins to move away from this problem of life as resistance, because life and freedom will be the 
correlate to what he calls the apparatuses of, of, of security. So the process of life and nature, the idea of political nature, as a physiocrat said, is now the correlate to security, which means that this kind of vitalist ontology that somehow subtended the earlier work on discipline is put in question. And now there is a much more stronger emphasis on, let's say, a kind of functionalist coexistence between life, freedom, and security. So in that sense, life cannot really resist. And I think, parenthetically, I'm not going to go into this, but this is, I mean, you know, there was a famously break between Foucault and Deleuze in the late 70s for personal reasons and maybe political reasons, undoubtedly political reasons as well. But I think there's also a philosophical reason for this, and, and which is perhaps more interesting. And this is the fact that Foucault was moving away from this ontology of life. He was beginning to historicize the concept of life in a much stronger way than he used in his, in, his early, in his earlier work. And I think this is the cause for the split between Deleuze and Foucault, which occurred in 77. So if modernity then becomes the object, or, or if life in modernity becomes the object of a science that emphasizes its history and depth, life appears as a multiplicity that must be surveyed and channeled, uh, there also emerges new modes of knowledge and power. And this is what Foucault, of course, described in, in, in the 1976 book on, 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 on the history of sexuality. And, and there, as I said, he, he proposed this kind of dual reading of life. There is one life which is constituted as an object of knowledge, and there is another life inside which resists, and they are always inextricably intertwined. And I think this, this, this intertwining is what Foucault's later work on does. But regardless of what Foucault's later might have changed his mind, this dual notion of life, I think, is what underlies other vitalist ontologies that, that, that were developed then in the wake of Foucault. For instance, as I said, in, in, in Deleuze and also in Maurizio Lazzarato, and they really pick up this notion of a positive vitalism, and to what extent now this contradicts Foucault and autism is, an, is another issue. Uh, and I would say that these ideas then of biopower and biopolitics today, I mean, they have been developed in so many different directions that that it's very difficult to find a common concept. We find you know, the versions of, of, of Agamben, and we find the versions of Deleuze, of Lazzarato, Paolo Virno, and Roberto Esposito, and many, many others of Hart and Negri. So I mean, the, this idea of what is biopower, what is biopolitics, is a very, very nebulous concept. Here I'm going to just stick to one version, the one version developed by Maurizio Lazzarato, because I think it's particularly relevant to architecture. Maurizio Lazzarato, you probably know, is an Italian now working in France, he's a sociologist, sociologist and philosopher, and he's published many books. Uh, he was, uh, up until recent years, he was, he was say, mainly famous for his theory of immaterial labor. I'm not really speak about this, but I will speak about Lazzarato's later work, especially the work you find in his book called uh, 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 The Revolutions of Capitalism, which was out in France a couple of years ago. So Lazzarato begins from Foucault's analysis of, of disciplinary societies, and he develops this further by drawing on Deleuze's theory of what Deleuze calls societies of control. And I have to say a few words about this concept. I mean, there's an essay by Deleuze called Postscriptum on the Societies of Control, where, he's, where he suggests that this idea of discipline and panopticism in Foucault is precisely what we have left behind. And, and I think this account of, of, of how we should develop Foucault, which I don't think then fits with Foucault's own theories, has still been extremely influential, so I have to say a few words about this. And, and Deleuze argues now that the structure of individuation, how we become individuals, the structure of, of, of localization of individuals that used to exist in earlier modern societies, are today have been transformed. They work through a kind of individualization, not through individuals, but, but through creating individuals. That is, we are constantly divided and fractured and multiplied. We are no longer, it is no longer enforced upon us to become identifiable, but the structure of power is that we should remain changing, transformable, sexually, erotically, phantasmatically, corporeal, intellectually. All of our effective capacities must be in a state of flux. And this is what contemporary capitalism somehow demands of us. That is, we should no longer be individuals, but a waveform, a kind of wave, a fluctuating waveform that supersedes the individual. And the centralizing function of the panopticon, I mean, to which we, of course, today can react with, with great nostalgia. I mean, it wouldn't be great if there was a central tower that we could somehow smash and become free. This panopticist model has today, the Deleuze argues, been fragmented into multiplicity of flexible monitoring instances, and the structure of a universal modulation has replaced the disciplinary mode. 
I mean, in discipline, we moved from one closed segment to another, from the school to the factory, from the factory to the hospital, from the hospital to the prison, from the prison to whatnot, something else, and so forth. But today, these compartmentalized milieus, which existed by being somehow segmented, you move from A to B, but you cannot be in A and B at the same time. They have been replaced by new smooth functions, and control is exerted over open spaces. It locates an element in an open environment, as in the case of the electronic bracelet, for instance, worn by the prisoner, which provides or denies you access to a given segment of space at a certain point in time. So if you look at specifically the, the case of, of, of imprisonment here, I mean, if the carceral system earlier produced independent but analogous subsets. Now, controlled spaces today are interconnected and numerical. So they are like sieves, for Deleuze says, like sieves whose mesh constantly shifts its permeability. So unlike the former disciplinary matrix, the new structures operate through passwords that regulate access to information banks. And this is, of course, everyday stuff today, but this essay is from 1990, so it predates all those stuff that we know today. So in that sense, it's a very visionary text. And what, what all these signals, Deleuze argues, is that the, it's, a, it's a kind of fundamental mutation in capitalism. And the enclosed factory has been replaced by a service economy characterized by certain dispersal. I mean, the disappearance of the factory as a model of production in advanced capitalist societies is also then reflected in, in the similar transformation of other spaces, office spaces, for instance, in which older forms of spatial hierarchies have since long been replaced by flattened structures that promote an ideal of flexibility and participation. I mean, the, 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 the most nightmarish situation of the more for the says, is when the company has a soul, as they say today. The company has a soul. And, and these brief remarks by, Foucault, by Deleuze are then the starting point for, for Lazzarato's theory, which he develops in this book called The Révolution du Capitalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he calls this no politics and 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 double o no politics. It's not no politics, but it's no politics. It comes from the Greek word nous, which means mind, thinking, reason. It's a term used by Plato and Aristotle, other Greek philosophers. Nous. So it's a politics that has to do with the mind, but not the mind in the sense of an intellectual capacity. Not really. Not really the mind as an, as a kind of. A, let's say, a set of concepts, but as the mind is a highly flexible and almost plastic entity. And, and, and Lazzarato develops this by also drawing a lot of the sociology of Gabriel Tard from the, from the turn of the former century, whose, whose micro-sociological analysis of, of, of imitation invention are important for, for Lazzarato. But, but contemporary capitalism, Lazzarato suggests, I mean, is no longer based on labor on the factory, and the institutions that regulate the relations between them, but is based on what he calls the collaboration of brains. This is the expression from Levolution de Capitalism. There is kind of networked intelligence that we find, for instance, in contemporary software development, where the capitalist mode of organization taps into and attempts to seize control. It taps into this collaboration of brains, which pre existed really, but it attempts also to seize control over it. So, no politics. Uh, implies then that capitalism not so much exploits our labor as it exploits our cognitive capacities. That is, those new productive forces that it must contain and channel into the corporate networks. And in order to achieve this, it somehow develops new neural political instruments. It creates consensus through images, sound bites, brands, and various visual technologies that are not really aimed at creating, uh, let's say, an intellectual consensus in the sense that we subscribe to certain concepts. We do this as well, but it works more fundamentally by, by impacting directly on the brain, somehow by bypassing the censorship and the reflective mechanisms of consciousness, uh, all of which uh, uh, somehow demand for, for us, as Lazarato says, this poses a new problem. This is a problem of no politics. It's, it's not really just you know, classical critique of ideology, the, how images deceive you and how images conceal certain things and why images, we have to learn to read the image as already, as already you know, Bertolt Brecht of Altibem and said at the beginning of the 20th century. But what kind of image or thought on the turn from the list that it makes possible. I mean, not just as a kind of passive effect, but as a constructive and active response. How can we counteract this incredible no political force that acts upon us? <laughs>
Uh, in a certain way, this remains close to what Foucault said about liberalism. I mean, liberalism, Foucault says, is not first and foremost an ideology in the sense of a false, distorted, or imaginary representation of reality, but it is a technology of power, or it is a way to work with reality. I mean, liberalism, Foucault argues, does not provide us with a kind of ideological smokescreen behind which other and more real things, you know, actions, practices, material events taking place. Instead, it is itself a practice. Liberalism works by making things real and by intensifying and redirecting processes already underway in reality itself. So in this sense, no political liberalism does not attempt to fool us. It attempts to transform us. It does not attempt to provide you with a distorted image of reality, but to but by way of understanding that reality is an image, it wants to transform reality itself. So in, in the wider context then, or in our context, I mean, visual arts, architecture, advertising, and media can be seen as part of this same process, whereby our minds are sculpted, sculpted in a very plastic sense, in order to attain new levels of action and reaction. And the noetic, the news, has in this sense, in a sense which by far transcends then the earlier versions of critique of ideology, the Marxist sense, become a site of conflict, even of political struggles. And it, it extends, as Lazzarato argues, at a level below consciousness, below human subjectivity, in the process of transformation which is neither nature nor culture. So this power and this politics would then inscribe itself as the most fundamental power of life, where our most basic effects are organized, you know, where memory, fantasy, and intelligence emerge, even a kind of neural plasticity, even at the level of the neural networks, we find this power interacting, this power acting upon us. Lazzarato's own proposals move in the direction of what he calls possible general intelligence. You know, we must conquer a kind of general intelligence, which would be the counter move on the same level of abstraction and efficiency as no politics. And this is very similar to the ideas that have been developed by another Italian sociologist, Paolo Virno, with this idea of post fordist labor and the development of a new virtuosity, as, 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 uh, as, as Virno calls it. Uh, uh, and I think with respect to the creation of art or architecture or the kind of stuff that we are about to produce, or not me, I'm a philosopher, but you as architects are about to produce, the question is then whether we, we need to rethink the capacity of the work of art, for instance, the architectural work, to, to, to does it still have the capacity to open up a space of freedom in the way that it had in early modernist theory? Can we understand the work of art as a way of internalizing the formal contradictions of society? which was the claim of Adorno, or, or do we have to somehow you know, discard the whole idea of critical theory? Because where do we find the point of leverage, the point of resistance to this incredibly subtle and, and somehow subconscious, I mean, I mean, I mean one should not speak about the subconscious because Freud he always spoke about the unconscious. But in this sense, there's a certain uh, no relevance in speaking about the subconscious because it exists on a kind of sub-level below consciousness. Does this, does this, do these transformations in fact entail a kind of dismantling of the very idea of resistance and the, and the, uh, resistance and the critical, or do they entail a kind of mutation into something else? And, 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 uh, and whether this is a radical shift or not, and whether, whether this whole idea of a general intelligence is a kind of mirage produced by the logic of capital itself, as many classical Marxists would say, remains to be seen. But I'm just going to end here by, by, by you know, citing some very imp important texts and essays in architectural criticism and theory from the last six, seven years, which I think all have addressed this issue in one way or another, uh, and, and, and to make some small remarks about them. So I have about 10 minutes left. More time, OK. How much do I have? 15, OK, great, great. But I mean, uh, um, uh, 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 I mean, in what, in, in the name of what should be, I mean, should we resist? Is is resistance still possible, or are we sculpted all the way down? I mean, in a certain way, this this version of biopolitics comes close to the very, I would say, somber and pessimistic view, in a certain way, proposed by Hart and Negri in the beginning of their book Empire, where they speak about biopolitical production and say that the empire, the name for contemporary capitalism, the empire produces its subjects all the way down. It produces them all the way down to the level of corporeal affectivity. And there is nothing, there is no nature, there is nothing left. There's nothing left from, from position from which to resist. Which then would of course imply that the idea of a critical theory is rather pointless. Because 
what should you name what should you criticize? Where is your point of leverage? Where is your starting point for a critique if you are produced all the way, all the way down? And 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 uh, I mean the claim that we must somehow move beyond the critical approach to architecture and perhaps to culture production at 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 large. I mean, it, of course, it need not somehow base itself on these particular theories of new politics, and they don't. I mean, most of them don't refer to Lazarato at all. Although I think this connection is probably what would provide them with the most persuasive and, pro and, pro and, and problematic power. Uh, there's an essay which triggered a lot of the discussion that I'm referring to. You, I think you referred to it yesterday, the, the essay by, by Robert Sommel and Sarah Whiting called, called Notes Around the Doppler Effect and Other Moods of Modernism. This essay uh, is, is from 2002, so it's almost 10 years ago. Uh, they want to discern a move away from the critical to what they call the projective, claiming that the inherited notion of autonomy as a precondition for in in engagement had in fact become defunct. And that what is re required is not so much a critique of reification or a kind of dialectical position to, to society as an analysis of the condition of emergence. I mean, how do things emerge and how can you develop a tactics, a more fluid tactics based on the idea of emergence? As an example of this different stance, they of course, as you always do, they cite Ram Kolhas, as you always do in this case. They cite, they cite Kolhas as appropriation of American mass culture, where architecture produces social life. It's not a text meant for reflective reading, but it aims to seduce and to instigate new events and behaviors. And, and they cite the case of Kolhas Downtown Athletic Club, you know, it's a famous part in his book, Delirious New York, uh, where he works with force and effect with A effect, not even effect, with A. Uh, and, this, and this downtown athletic club, as Kolas himself proposes, represents the complete conquest floor by floor of the skyscraper by social activity. The American way of life, know-how, initiative, definitely overtake uh, the kind of theoretical lifestyle modification that the various 20th century avant gods had been insistently proposing. Uh, the skyscraper becomes a machine to generate and intensify desirable forms of human intercourse, which in this case means that the metropolitan bachelor is the ultimate form of life, and the club is the ultimate bachelor machine. I mean, in, in Kola's text, you should probably know all by heart, it's incredibly ironical, incredibly ironical and twisted. It is obvious that he does not mean this as a kind of utopia. Being naive, uh, someone in Whiting, of course, read this as if, as if it were a kind of very positive, very positive proposal that, that you should decide to live in this particular life. So, and they have other examples, but this is perhaps the most intriguing one. So instead of dialectics negation, Sommel and Whiting, they see in this what they call a kind of Doppler effect, where the perception depends on the location and speed of the viewer and the source of light. And the disciplinary quality of architecture, they say, they lie, it lies in performance. And, and throughout this essay, they constantly cite Foucault, not as a way to criticize discipline, but, but discipline becomes a new practice and becomes a kind of diagram, it's a distribution of singularities, they say, uh, and they become design tools. <laughs> the kind of analysis that Foucault once proposed to prisons, schools, and military barracks, and hospitals is now transformed into a way, as, as they say, to distribute singularity in space, becomes a design tool, which is very intriguing, intriguing transformation. Uh, 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 and in, in this projective mood, I'm continuing now to refer to this essay, Sommel and Whiting, in this projective mood, and in, in saying this, they obviously echo a kind of pop art sensibility. They cite Jean Baudrillard in the footnotes. We move from hot to cool, they say. Architecture ceases to worry about separating itself from, from the everyday in terms of autonomy and resistance. It becomes just as relaxed as television, they say which is obviously some great cultural achievement. And, 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 and he says, someone writing the end by, by strange enough ascertaining that, that such, a projective, such a projective practice, uh, um, uh, quote, does not necessarily attain a capitulation to the market forces, but actually respects and reorganizes multiple economies, ecologies, information systems, and social groups, end quote. I mean, that this conclusion by Samuel Whiting undoubtedly contains an element of wishful thinking. I think this was ruthlessly brought to the fore by Michael Speaks in a series of essays that unabashedly call for the end of theory, the end of critique, not just the end of critique, but the end of theory, and an adaption to the forces of the market. Architecture schools, this is several essays from the, from the same time by, by, by Michael Speaks. And, 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 
uh, architecture schools, speaks claims, they have failed to develop intellectual culture that would be in tune with the real world, and instead what he, what he calls deconstruction and Marxism, quote unquote, deconstruction and Marxism rules, creating a, uh, quote again, aversion to the marketplace, the very milieu of intervention and shaper of any future architecture, unquote. So unlike the rather subtle theoretical exercises on Sommel and Whiting, I think speaks makes no excuses. I mean, the text can be read as a call to order, a demand that we should abandon theory in general and instead, instead opt for a stance that is unapologetically fashionable and desirable. Theory, this is speaks again, theory is not just irrelevant, but was and continues to be an impediment to the development of a culture of innovation architecture, unquote. I think it would be easy to dismiss these kind of claims simply because of their intellectual vulgarity, or, or because they are, I mean, at least in Europe, they appear as kind of echoes of, of generational conflicts and skirmishes in American academia. Now, but still, I think they point to, to a, a deeper problem. And as we know, to the bottom, I mean, to, the, I mean, to what extent can the emphasis on the effective, with an A, affective, the senses and the dimension of the no political, create concepts that in any way allow us to gain a distance from the world? Jeffrey Kipnis, but in response to both Samuel and Whiting and, and, and Michael Speaks, has argued that the strategies of negation must give way to resistance that works by way of sensations. He also draws on Deleuze, particularly on Deleuze's book on Francis Bacon, uh, Logic of Sensation. It works by, by way of sensation, and he suggests that architecture should work like the soundtrack in a film, he says like the soundtrack in a film, since its political dimension resides in its impact on our effectivity and, and our, on a kind of direct impact on our nervous system. I think this metaphor, if, if it is a metaphor, perhaps not, still is, is somehow telling. I mean, for, for what, 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 what would a soundtrack be if not a highly specialized service, I mean, called upon to support the main action? but it would never endow it with any kind of agency of its own, and surely not any critical power. I mean, it's very difficult to imagine a soundtrack to a film that would be critical to the film. Uh, and the task of architecture uh, as resistance, Kipnis claims, would then be to create new sensations, new alliances, and this it comes close to Lazzarato, and, and undoubtedly on a kind of utopian note. Yeah? The possibility of, of resistance in the society of control and no power lies in creating connections that resist being appropriated, which is then, of course, poised as a kind of infinite task. Uh, 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 so I think, I mean, these are all cases of, 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 of let's say, fairly recent interventions, some of them which react the idea of criticality, some of them which attempt to reinvent. And I think they all point to the fact that, that critical theory must be rethought somehow. I mean, the claim that, that adversary models based in negation, dialectics, and contradictions are obsolete. I mean, no matter how exaggerated and one-sided some of them may be, they all point in the same direction. They cannot simply be dismissed. And I think, uh, 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 I think there are many new avenues that open up here. And I think I don't have any any specific answer to this, but I think it, it is a question that needs to be posed. I mean, there are other ways you can do this. For instance, as in much art history, contemporary philosophy, when you're encountering philosophy, kind of neuromaterialism that has become widespread in analytical philosophy where everything is about the brain. You know, the brain is the new catchphrase. The brain contains everything. Many art historians claim that art history must be rewritten from the point of view of evolutionary biology. So for instance, the great historian Harry Francis Mulgrave, his recent book, The Architect's Brain, where he claims to, to deduce the whole of art history and architecture from, from evolutionary biology. And all of this really points to the fact that, that, that this specific theoretical site is becoming invested. We need to understand this, this notion of life and no politics as a contested site. And everyone is trying to, it's up for grabs. Everyone are trying to lay their hands on it. Uh, and I think, what would then be a critical theory? I mean, what is critical about critical theory? And in what sense is, is the theory? I think there, you cannot settle this question by reference in the past or any form of earlier artistic practice. But in order to answer the question, what is critical, what is theory, itself requires an act of invention. And these inventions cannot help but being bound up with the current moment, with the current state of affairs. And they must draw on the most advanced productive forces 
while still trying to imagine other possible social relations. And in this, they of course always run the risk of being virtually indistinguishable from what they attempt to analyze, which is not something to, I mean, to be deplored. I mean, it's just exactly the same situation as Marx in, Marx in Das Kapital. I mean, the analysis of capital is on the same level as capital itself. It cannot be less advanced than capital. It must be equally advanced and then the final end move one step beyond. So critical theory can obviously not congeal into some incessant referencing of the past, the historical avant-garde, the 60s or some other moment in time, nor can it leap ahead into a utopian future where it would become sealed in something purely imaginary, because in those cases, I think Michael Spies speaks would be, his criticism would be entirely correct. Critical theory must be a kind of imminent practice, moving with its time, but, but always prepared to invent new tools. And, and, uh, uh, and I think, at, at present, the society of control, or the society of no political power, which uh, one must remember is only part of a larger global order. I mean, this is what, how it occurs in the Western societies, so, uh, and global order that contains many technological levels and, and certain spaces of the world where, let's say, sovereign power has absolutely not disappeared. If this society constitutes a horizon, it also generates new images of thoughts from the most complex one to the most imbecile ones. And, and to extract from these uh, images a transformative power of philosophy and critical theory, I think, is a formidable task that cannot be rejected. Thanks. Thank you very much, Wale. Uh, do we have any questions? I have one question. Yeah. I was thinking uh, something that strike, s struck me when I heard your lecture. I was thinking of uh, Frederick Jameson and his uh, when he speaks about late capitalism and how capitalism is kind of going into every corner in our bodies, in our world, and even colonize the unconscious. Uh, do you have any comment on that? No, but I mean, this is um, Frederick James's idea of late capitalism and, and postmodernism already in the early 80s. And, and, and oh, on some level, he's saying the same, same thing as Lazzarato, although he's using other references. He has a more classical Marxist vocabulary. He draws on Hegel. He cites other sources. But I mean, I mean, I think him and Lazzarato, they see the same phenomenon, although they use slightly different vocabularies to, to, um, to understand it. But in substance, their analysis are pretty much the same. Okay. Because I was thinking maybe it was, you know, a very big shift between, between these two thinkers. I mean, it, so many years <laughs> has passed, so to say. No, but I mean, I mean, both of them, to some extent, they have the same sources, and, and uh, I'm not really sure to what extent Lazzarato is aware of Jameson's work, he probably is, but he comes from the background in Foucault, and more concrete sociological work done on unemployment in France, and I mean, of course, Lazzarato develops um, a very technical and philosophical discourse, drawing on Leibniz and Tard and Deleuze and other things, but he also has a very, very interesting work on, on uh, corporations, Italian uh, political movements, advertising in France and Italy. So he, what, what is so interesting about Lazzarato that he manages to create you know, a kind of bridge between theoretical and empirical work. And he draws some particular Italian and French examples, whereas Fred, you know, Fred Jameson comes from the background of the American 60s and he has mm -hmm. other sources. But I mean, substantially, I think they cohere these okay. two analysis. Thank you.